Okay. All right, I'll ask our other um, faculty to come up on stage. Hello, Karen. Thank you very much for joining us. That was a great presentation. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here. Nice to see you. I'm going to start off with a question for you, um, uh, kind of popular amongst the people online and in the audiences. Um, of the many factors you pointed to as being useful in life lifestyle modification and preventing RA, is there any that you think is more important than the other? I mean, again, patients are sometimes reluctant to make the changes of weight loss and smoking and drinking and exercise and, and vitamin D and, and fish oil, or whatever. So is there, do you have a, um, a preference for what you want to push on most? Good question. Yeah, I think smoking has to come first. I think if you see a current smoker, you really have to push on the smoking. Smoking is one of the strongest risk factors for RA. Um, and along with genetics and maybe silica. And it's a huge risk factor for so many other multimorbidities, right? <laughs> so we, we really have to reduce smoking. I, mean, I think work on smoking first, maybe obesity second. It's hard to work on all of these. Uh, I think that's why the pre-RA trial gave people the option to choose which risk factor they wanted to work on first. Actually, we, you know, they were told which of their risk factors they had, and then they, we assessed their motivation to work on one or two of these risk factors, and they got to choose. But smoking would be the very, very top of my list. Well, um, so another interesting issue is that of um, intervening in people who may be preclinical RA. So, um, and whenever we ask this question of experts, uh, usually there's a pushback in saying, no, I don't treat preclinical RA, I, or I just treat symptoms and whatnot. So let me just sort of make it even a little harder. It's a first degree relative, double positive, high titer. You showed evidence that those people have as much as a 60, 70% chance of progressing to RA. And the person's a smoker and they're having arthralgias. Would you treat, or I'm gonna ask this of all, uh, each, each of our faculty. Karen, you wanna start? So definitely would work on the, the risk factor of smoking, right? Because uh, so you have to stop smoking now to decrease your risk for many years to come. Uh, we've also shown the smoke, you know, smoking cessation now, the risk of developing RA doesn't go down for 20 years. I wouldn't mention that to the patient, but we do see that it takes a long time to get back to that, that risk of a never smoker. Uh, so working on the smoking, referral to smoking cessation clinic, et cetera. Would I treat, I think if they had arthralgias and, I'm, um, and maybe elevated ESR and I'm really convinced, I would not start the rituximab. I would not at this point start the abatacept. But I might give them plaquenil. I might give them, this, the trial is ongoing, this top RA trial using plaquenil. I think plaquenil, hydroxychloroquine, um, doesn't have a lot of um, big time you know, immunosuppression with it. It may be um, good at forestalling the development of, of RA, in, in my opinion. So I think with the, you know, a lot of shared decision making about the fact that we don't have the data yet. I think that Plaquenil may have the ability to, in lupus it does look like it probably does push off the development disease, so probably in RA as well. That might be my choice. Well, the online discussion sort of supports what you say, and we'll have to wait for the, for the, for the data from the STOP RA trial, which is a very large trial that maybe we'll read out in the next year. But let me ask Janet, what would you do in this case? Right, so there's arthralgias and then there's arthralgias. So basically, if the patient but has you want to arthralgias, that for me? well, okay, so I mean, uh, I'm not talking PIP, DIP, OA, I'm not talking mechanical back pain. So if you have your wrist, second and third MCPs, maybe fifth MTP are arthralgic, and uh, I'll just give them a normal inflammatory marker. I would discuss smoking cessation, but I think that the two ways that you'd look at it is um, anti-malarial, I agree, or the uh, pre-RA, who was basically, I think in my opinion, RA patients with synovitis that didn't yet meet ACR criteria, randomizing to methotrexate or not, um, methotrexate decreased you making the classification criteria for RA. So I'd also offer methotrexate. The good thing about hydroxychloroquine is you don't have to do lab monitoring. It actually improves cardiovascular benefit, but also so does methotrexate. So I think I'd sort of do that. You want them to be social. You want them to walk to the restaurant and go to the no smoking area. Take your fish oil and vitamin D along the way um, and all those things. So you'd look at the other things as well and try to be a bit holistic. 
I would agree with all of the above. And uh, apart from risk factor management, I would uh, definitely make patient aware of the risk and discuss in terms of shared decision making uh, the risk of development rheumatoid arthritis, the, some uh, potential side effects of treatment. But Plaquenil seems to be um, uh, fairly benign in, in this uh, patient population. And, and I would agree would be a good choice. And then close follow up uh, to, to monitor uh, on symptom development and improvement uh, in this uh, particular individual. You know, I, I've, I've been impressed that rheumatologists, whenever asked, are really very good at counseling on smoking cessation and pushing hard on that. I don't know that we're so good at all the other um, things we should do in primary care sort of management, but we're really good at pushing hard on that, and I think that's commendable. Um, we have a question from the audience. How does uh, vitamin D and omega-3 work at a cellular level? So that's a question for me, and there, there is another talk or two, but there are lots of uh, biologic mechanisms by which uh, vitamin D and omega-3s may decrease the risk of developing RA, and they have lots of, first of all, um, vitamin D is a very um, pleiotropic hormone. You know, it, bi it binds to the vitamin D receptor uh, in the nucleus, and it, it uh, regulates an entire array of genes re related to immunologic functions and has known functions. So all kinds of great studies in vivo and vitro um, and animal models showing effects on the B cells and T cells and, and dendritic cells, antigen presenting cells. So it really has um, a very good um, immunomodulating uh, properties, but it had never been tested in a trial, prospective trial, to see whether actually taking vitamin D would do anything to the, on the prevention side, uh, preventing the you know, development of disease. There have been a lot of cross-sectional studies in humans with every known chronic and inflammatory disease showing that vitamin D levels are lower, but that was not necessarily causative. So patients with rheumatoid arthritis um, compared to those who don't have lower vitamin D levels, but that didn't mean that the low vitamin D caused the, the RA. And for omega-3 fatty acid, there are also very exciting mechanisms by which um, the omega-3 uh, metabolites of DHA and EPA go on to um, then be metabolized into a whole array of the specialized pro-resolving mediators, which are lipid mediators that are not only anti-inflammatory, but they are pro-resolution, so they resolve inflammation. The anesthesiologists are very interested in these. And um, in many ways, they think of diseases like RA as failures of uh, resolution of chronic inflammation. So that once the inflammatory cytokine pathways get really um, amplified and revved up, it, it, there's failure to downregulate them. So omega-3 fatty acids probably work less on the immune side and more on the pro-resolution of inflammation side. But maybe two different mechanisms, but the, these um, SPMs, the specialized pro-resolving mediators, include things like the resolvins and the lipoxins, the maricins, the protectins, lots of research going on. NIH is very interested in pro-resolution pathways. Uh, that omega-3 fatty acids contribute to. So lots of biologic reasons that, um, that both vitamin D and omega-3 fatty acid would be able to decrease the development of uh, rheumatoid arthritis I, and other autoimmune diseases. Can I give you a follow-up on, on VITAL? Um, VITAL was uh, set up initially to look at prevention of cancer and cardiac events, is that correct? But yes. It, yeah. But it didn't show a signal there or benefit there. Do you want to uh, hypothesize why it was effective in reducing autoimmune, autoimmune risk but not cancer risk? Or is it a threshold issue? Yeah. Uh, so I think I was very lucky that uh, Joanne Manson and Julie Burian were starting this trial. And um, there is actually much stronger rationale for studying autoimmune diseases than there is for studying cancer and cardiovascular disease. Um, I think that the data for cancer and cardiovascular disease were um, also um, you know, similarly cross-sectional in nature and, and confusing, and so we really needed a trial to address them, but the biologic mechanisms were really not as strong as they are for autoimmune disease prevention, um, and potentially that's why we didn't see the, the effect there. Um, so, right, those, uh, and for many other outcomes, uh, we looked at chronic knee pain over the, with using Womax scores among a subcohort of people who had very severe knee pain at baseline. We didn't see any effect. They looked at atrial fibrillation. We've looked at a variety of different outcomes in the VITAL trial. We were lucky to start the autoimmune disease uh, part of the trial right um, prior to um, randomization. During the run-in phase, we, we figured out um, if people had a history of 
autoimmune disease, and we we started um, following them for incident autoimmune disease from from the get from the start. And um, we have we have some follow up results which I've submitted to ULAR, so hopefully they'll be accepted because we continue to follow people in the um, now after um, the five years of randomization to see how long the effects will be maintained or sustained. And this, they're looking very good. So that's all I can say now. But and in particular, looking really good for RA. So we're not going to get a ULR scoop right yet. We have to <laughs> okay. Well, no, no, no. It's going to be accepted, right? All right. Um, Elena, you know, um, I can think of maybe I think it was 12 years ago. I remember being in a room with Philip and a few others and working on talks for rheumatologists, including a comorbidity talk, and we ran that around, and rheumatologists liked the data about comorbidity, but and they said, well, I'll talk about this, but it's not my job to do it. I don't have the time to do it. Um, but yet in the survey, they, everybody in the audience, because we just told them they should do it, they kind of leaned towards, yes, we'll do it. Um, so we're the experts at RA. Does that mean we should be the, the person who really does deliver complete RA care, and should we take hold of comorbidity management? Well, uh, you know, it, it's a great question because, um, and, and it, it, it depends on type of the practice and um, also on um, how complex the multimorbidity profile is. At the minimum, just recognizing uh, the comorbidity and uh, setting up a referral for a patient and potentially informing, informing of the risks and uh, some screening and prevention um, uh, guidelines for the patient would be important. but. Um, Otherwise, you know, the, the providers from other specialties should be able to usually um, take it from there. Some practices, of course, are not set up to uh, necessarily uh, organize a timely referral, so that becomes a little bit more challenging. Uh, but uh, I, I think that at, at the time of recognition and, and just uh, trying to follow up the patient and coordinate their care is what, what the role of the provider, um, a particular rheumatology provider, uh, would be in terms of management of comorbidities because sometimes, especially in the younger patients, rheumatologists would be the first one to see that patient who may not be even having a regular primary care visits or may not even have any primary care provider otherwise because they're healthy apart from their, um, or they think so, apart from their rheumatologic condition. So um, rheumatologists can play potentially a very important role in it. Well, 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 I'm going to just ask one more question. Um, for those who, I mean, we have issues where not all our patients have primary care and we want them to have primary care. That needs to be resolved. But um, many have asked online, what should be the minimum or what should we be doing as far as screening? What would be your recommendation to rheumatologists that in the least you should be doing the following? And I think um, most of practices would be doing, uh, you know, um, assessment of BMI and uh, screening for blood pressure, uh, potentially blood sugar and uh, uh, smoking. So th those are the major risk factors, and then it goes from there. Uh, if they are on uh, medications, as, uh, you know, uh, such as uh, uh, JAK inhibitors and such, we would be screening for lipid levels anyway. But um, otherwise, you know, it's it's uh, sort of depends again on how much responsibility the provider is willing to take and how much. Uh, how soon they can refer to a specialist. Janet, you were going to say? Right. So I think that one of the biggest gaps in care is that we might know and don't tell anybody. So if you don't put in your note saying, um, treat this RA patient like you would a type 2 diabetic with respect to targets of blood pressure, lipids, or our patients are at higher risk of OP, or we follow cholesterol, but now I want you to treat it. If we don't tell them, it's actually the buck is stopping at us. And I'll tell you, I can't treat diabetes anymore. All the drugs start with the letter J now, and I don't know what they are. So the J drugs aren't my thing. So I think we have to share communication. And if you tell the primary care or the other specialist, um, here's what we recommend and who's going to do it, I think that goes a long way to help the patient. Is um, the rheumatologist role in primary care or comorbidity management any different in Canada? Uh, well, we're, we're probably as rusty the longer we get out as uh, many, many of us would be. Once you're in practice for a while, a lot of us don't do internal medicine call anymore. So um, we do have family physician shortages all over the place in, in uh, Canada. But I would say three quarters to 80% of our patients actually have a primary care. But again, if we don't tell them, 
Um, so a lot of people have in their EMR, I see it with the IBD patients, this EMR, a final page saying, these are the risks for patients with IBD, maybe we should be saying the same thing for ours, or the risks on biologics, the added risks might be, you know, we heard about the skin assessment. So all of you are in medical centers where you have integrated care and, you know, big primary care, family medicine, is, it, is that better for your patients? Do you think your patients fare better in that situation? Because many of the practitioners are out there by themselves and don't have an a, a internist in primary care who um, they can point to or talk to about this one patient. I think there is a positive in that and also um, I would like to, uh, apart from uh, partnering with primary care, there is an important role for interdisciplinary clinics such as cardioromatology clinic, for, for example, that uh, is becoming more popular and being set up not only in Europe but Canada but also in, um, in uh, the United States as well and uh, functioning fairly well and uh, at least, you know, talking with our cardiologists, they are very willing to help us and take responsibility on managing uh, patients with uh, rheumatologic conditions who are referred to them. So they, they are really on board with that. All right. I, Jen, I have a question for you about, um, um, are you thinking about using combination biologics? Well, um, first In of all, RA? right. So first of all, off-label. Secondly, if I give a person rituximab, how long do I wait to restart what I did before as a secondary failure or start a new thing? So technically, some people on rituximab, if they don't achieve their response and if I'm not retreating them right away uh, with rituximab until six months out, have I started something else? Is that a combo? So the short answer is yes. And we did hear the hint uh, from Artie and others yesterday about in IBD sometimes two expensive advanced therapies were better than one in, in a trial so but I think we need the data and I think that what's prohibiting is not necessarily the side effect profile of adding two things to get increased serious infection it's dollars mm -hmm. um, in this session and a few others there's been uh, a talk of, of uh, monotherapy which is um, I don't I, I have my own views about that but should we be using monotherapy? And should, if you are going to use monotherapy, should you lean on IL-6 first? Janet, you want to start on that? Sure. So first of all, uh, lots of people you think are on methotrexate aren't. So that's the first thing. Yeah. So uh, when a patient says, can I lower my dose, I usually say, when did you stop it? And the trainees think I'm hearing impaired, <laughs> and I'm not hearing impaired at all. I'm just, and they often, like, I call them on it, and they, they tell us. So um, if, if I were a patient who felt very unwell on methotrexate, even though it was helping, I think it would be very difficult to look at that one day a week and feel sick for two or three days after. However, um, with good tolerability of methotrexate, some people still want to get off it because they want to decrease increased med burden or they don't want to have as many labs, things like that. So should we use monotherapy? Um, ideally, two drugs are better than one, usually, at least for induction, for maintenance. Two drugs are often better than one. But in reality, one in three patients is not on methotrexate or is on monotherapy. So yeah, we should sometimes. IL-6, mm, I mean, I think we just choose what we have access to. I, we have lots of patients on monotherapy on just about any product. Is that ideal? I don't know. Karen, do you have a way or an approach to motivate patients to change their modifiable risk factors? Something you could advise the audience about? Well, I think that um, the pre-RA um, trial that we did showed that you know just giving them the, the handout from the Arthritis Foundation is probably not adequate. Um, and of course, we get 20 minutes for with our patients, so that's probably not adequate either. Um, it would be nice to be able to get everyone to see the nutritionist. Uh, to go to the smoking cessation clinic, to you know, to get to physical therapy, to get a home regimen for exercise. I think we really need tailored, individualized, motivating, um, you know, multidisciplinary care to get patients to to adopt new behaviors. And but I do think that um, informing people about their individualized risk and how their lifestyle behaviors impact that risk does. You know, it may take some time, but probably people do think about it. If they've had a family member with really bad RA or other autoimmune disease, they probably are a little bit more motivated and they tell them so um, that they don't want to get you know, RA that badly. And so what can they do? Um, it is easier maybe to give them a supplement, but I think we also have to move on to modifiable um, lifestyle behaviors. I wonder in this situation... <laughs> 
um, if a uh, nurse led care management model would be uh, an appropriate one in terms of um, reducing the effort from the provider and also improving the follow up for the patient uh, on their adherence to the recommendations and just to uh, follow up how they are doing. I, I know that nurse care, uh, nurse led care management models are working fairly good and um, um, in our clinic for educating patients and following how uh, they adhere into medicine. So perhaps for uh, management of risk factors, that can be one of the uh, options as well. Okay. Jenna, we have a question um, from a few people about um, being handcuffed by insurance and that um, before they can switch, they have to fail two TNF inhibitors before they can go to a jack. Is that reasonable in your opinion or should they be fighting that? Well, I think you should always fight something where you have uh, your, we have proof from RCTs of where to use the various interventions, number one. And number two, you did have until recently, well, you had FDA approval, um, not just sometimes access only post-TNF, but you had approval from CSD MARD onward by FDA. So I think for any product, um, we have to sometimes um, coerce the insurers to help help them, the patient, get what we think they need. Um, and I think you have to um, choose your battles. <laughs> because if a patient, to me, two TNFs and then something else doesn't make a lot of sense because I'm usually, if I'm using a TNF inhibitor in RA, I'm often one TNF and then another MOA. So two TNFs in a row in RA is not even a, a standard of care for everybody. Um. I, I want to ask one last question of, of uh, Elena, but, ask, but if you, each of you have a question for each other, you can follow that up on, 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 after this. But Elena, you, you mentioned that um, the patients with multimorbidity don't necessarily have um, um, a, a lack of DMARD initiations, um, but they have a problem with adherence, they have a problem with dropping off therapy, they have a problem with poor outcomes at many levels. Um, so I find those factors, is, is the issue that um, related to age of the people with multimorbidity, or is it, can you explain how they get, they, although they start out okay, they seem to not do so okay? Yeah, I think it's for this question, and of course that uh, uh, was, that is not studied, studied extensively. There was just a, a couple of, uh, of observational studies addressing this question, so perhaps more are needed to actually understand the, the problem. But um, it, it can be the issue of adherence, tolerance of the medication, um, interaction between the medications that they are on. Um, and uh, I think, you know, involving uh, pharmacists in, in the discussions as well um, on um, medications uh, to discuss the medication side effects and uh, how medications interact with each other and their risk for a, a particular patient would be helpful um, in, in clinical practice. In terms of research, of course, we will have um, hopefully more studies coming up to, to explain this phenomenon. Yeah. I, and it's almost as if we should be tagging these people as high-risk RA patients, you know, and, and, and actually coming in, making better use of that term. Yeah, and they may be uh, so-called difficult to treat uh, in, in several ways that, uh, that were mentioned. So I, I guess they're just challenging population medically um, due to a number of comorbidities. And of course, for each patient, it depends which uh, combination of comorbidities they have, uh, and that would influence, uh, of course, the, the outcome. Um, Right. And if I could add one thing to that, yeah. there's also pill burden, right? I mean, if with the number of comorbidities you have, the number of medications that some people are, you know, when it gets up to 30 medications and you're adding two more, I, I can see their point. They just can't take medication all day and it's just not digestible. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's hard to adhere to, to some of these crazy there, regimens. There's a term multi-complexity and that relates to multimorbidity. So the complexity of management uh, of patients with multimorbidity and polypharmacy. So indeed it's an, a very important and uh, uh, interesting concept uh, for the patient and for the providers. And, and just a final thing on adherence, I think the pill packs are really helpful for patients, but the pharmacists, not, not willfully, but they sometimes make it so complicated that your twice a day meds, they put four times a day and arbitrarily put things and then say, you can't take your thyroid med with 
food, even though you have for the last 20 years and things like that. You can't, can't take calcium when you take your PPI, et cetera. So I think sometimes I just say to patients, I do look at their med list before I say it, but just take it all in the morning. You got all day then to try and just like a, a, a m, p m, lunch, supper, nighttime, just pop them all in at once because you're better to take it once and get some of it or most of it in than not at all. Yeah, and that relates to treatment burden, and really it's a whole, um, a, a full-time job for a patient to manage the medications, the visits, and that's, uh, that's also, uh, that's burdensome and difficult, so patients need help. in Navigator, uh, a health yes. navigator yeah. would be helpful. All right, I want to thank our faculty for an excellent session uh, and for helping us conclude our Room Now Live 2022. Thank you very much. Great. Thank, thank you. you. All right, um, we're going to wrap up. Artie and I are going to wrap up with um, uh, just a few final things. Uh, thanks for those who um, have hung in there throughout the whole meeting and are, are still um, in front of the computer, in front of the, uh, um, the screen here. Uh, I want to um, just say that the uh, winners of the online engagement, the, um, what's it called? Go what? Came on. Came on. Um, <laughs> A, game on A. Um, you didn't win. I didn't win this one. I don't know why. The, um, the first place winner uh, was for the uh, free registration for Room Now Live 2023 and a free stay at the hotel is Adnan Peer. Uh, he's in the online uh, audience. Second place and uh, third place, um, the winners of uh, Amazon gift card is Vijaya Murthy and uh, Christopher Gibson. So you'll be hearing from us uh, here at Room Now. Thank you very much.